Are you ready? Are you sitting down? The Shine On Podcast 2022. I've said before and I'll say it again. Divorce affects so many people out there. The money, the property, the assets, so many high-profile divorces. The conflict, the allegations, huge legal fee and support awards. You name it. Divorce is a true team sport. Incredible insight. Top divorce stories. Shine On Podcast. Shine On Podcast. The Shine On Podcast 2022. Episode 34 of the Shine On Podcast, I'm Evan Shine. It is often said that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. On today's episode, I sit down with Dr. Galit Atlas to talk about her newly released book, Emotional Inheritance, which was released in January of this year and is already a bestseller, a number one release on Amazon. And if you haven't read it, you should. I absolutely couldn't put this book down. It was that good and enlightening. And this is a book that goes deep, deep into how we live, deep into exploring why we are the way we are. And the book explores the often thought about but unanswered questions of why we may act in a certain way, what may hold us back and why, why we view the world in a certain light, why we find ourselves in the same relationships time and time again, why we find ourselves repeating the same behavior over and over And what is it about our past that influences our perception and future behavior and our choices? The book sheds light on things not often discussed, family secrets. It opens up the conversation on inherited traumatic experiences and the impact these experiences have on our lives. On today's episode of the Shine Up podcast, we're going to talk with Dr. Atlas about inherited family trauma and the relationships between this emotional inheritance and their lives, relationships, and marriages. Following the Shine on Spotlight is my interview with Dr. Galit Atlas. This is an interview you do not want to miss. Coming up next is the docket. All right, Counselor Sir, are you ready for the docket? Dave, let's do it. Fire it up. All right. And now, let's see what's on the docket. The... First piece on the docket, Evan, comes to us from Marketplace.org. Item one. Article poses the question, what's it like when an algorithm moderates your divorce? This is something that's in the news a lot, algorithms controlling our lives. And the article uses an example of when an algorithm was used to mediate a divorce case and what the consequences of reducing a human element in such a personal event could be. Your thoughts on this, Evan? Dave, you got it absolutely right. Look, we're seeing technology play a role in our lives each and every day. How we communicate, how we receive and process our news, how we interact, how we shop, how we learn, how we work, how we date, and now how we divorce. There is an app out there for anything and everything. And this article really comes from an excerpt from the book, The Loop, how technology is creating a world without choices and how to fight back. The article talks about an app The Co-Parenter, a divorce and parenting app that apparently locks onto patterns for couples based on how they interact, and it can negotiate with one another, and essentially it uses an algorithm to anticipate what may be coming up or what future disagreements may be. Look, algorithms predicting behavior, it's not something that's new. We've seen them play a role in different ways and different industries in the past. How about baseball and the movie Moneyball? And Oakland A's general manager, Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt, how we construct our sports teams when we use algorithms, how we build championship teams. The days of the scouts eyeing players, they're gone, and they've been replaced by computers and statistical geniuses and people who really have an expertise in algorithms. And so, yes, it's absolutely believable that there can be and there is an algorithm that can assist couples. But the key word is assist. Because there is that human element and emotional part of both marriage and divorce. And a co-parenting app is never going to replace the detail and the substantive work that really goes into negotiating a divorce. But if there's an algorithm that can help us figure it out, I'm all for that. But producer Dave, let me ask you, is this something that you would have found helpful? I know you went through the process and as you look back, is is an app like co-parenter would have that been helpful well 
I'm for any gadget that can help things along or maybe speed processes up, but it is a scary proposition to think that something as human and personal as a divorce and guiding people through a divorce could ever be truly replaced by artificial intelligence. And I know that you would agree with me that I don't think you're at risk of being replaced by an algorithm as a family lawyer. (laughs) Sure, I I hope not. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. So, But but, but there's a a benefit to it where where it it assists. It could assist the couple. It could assist the divorce attorney. But a replacement? I don't think so. Agree, agree. Next on the docket, we have an item that comes from the website clutchpoints.com. Item two. From the world of basketball, Warriors star Steph Curry's heartbreaking message to parents amid divorce proceedings is the headline of this article. It's been eight months since Steph's mom, Sonia, divorced her husband, Del Curry, also a pretty good basketball player in his time. Steph has a message to parents amid this divorce. And your thoughts on this one, Evan? Hey, first let me ask you, have you ever seen anyone in the NBA, in NBA history, with the sweeter jump shot with a sweeter three-point stroke than Steph Curry. No, I think he's completely changed the game. And kids kids now, want no matter how tall they are, we, we have seven-footers hoisting up three-pointers because it's <laughs> – I mean, the, the, the yeah. NBA has taken a totally different direction. Yeah. Steph Curry has been a big reason why. But, look, we're not going to talk about Steph Curry's jump shot or, you know, his, his incredible skills on the court. What we're going to talk about is Steph Curry – and the message, and really the heartfelt message that he sent to his parents. Look, it's no secret that his parents are going through a divorce, and we've seen it play out in the media, and there's been reports on the reason for the split. But my takeaway from this, look, it doesn't matter your success, your celebrity status, or even your age. Watching and experience your parents going through a divorce, it's never easy, no matter who you are, Steph Curry or somebody else. Steph issues a brilliant and really heartfelt message to his parents, supporting his parents, looking to support his parents by focusing on the positive and what he learned from both of his parents. What he also does is reflect that he is who he is because of them. He also, which is a really important lesson, he talks about his own marriage and his relationship, both with his wife and his kids, and really what are the lessons that he can learn from his parents as it applies to his own life, especially going through this as an adult. Number three on the docket, the continuing saga of a celebrity divorce item comes to us from cinemablend.com. Item three, Billy Bean. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, Brad Pitt, the aforementioned Brad Pitt (laughs) is now suing Angelina Jolie as their lengthy divorce drags on. We've heard about this for years but a component in their divorce that seemed to be settled may be back on the table, so says this article. Your thoughts on this one, Evan? Dave, just when we thought we could say goodbye to the Brad Pitt and Angelina divorce, we are back. Brad and Angelina are back. And look, the public dispute has centered around their children and allegations and various claims made by both sides. The fight now appears to be over the winery that the couple owned together and about a sale and shares in the winery. And Dave, I don't know about you, it would make it easier to read about Brad and and Angelina and their divorce if we actually had a glass of wine or even a bottle. (laughs) Because, I mean, Dave, this divorce doesn't end. I mean, it's the winery today. And look, what's next? And there's going to be a next. I can all but guarantee it because with these two, there's always a next. There's always a disagreement. There's always another fight. And at some point, at some point, I would think that the two of them and their representatives could work to to really taking this out of the public eye, public spotlight, and bringing an end to really everything we've seen over the past several years. There's an item in the news about how ADHD can strain relationships and how couples are coping. That's the topic of this episode's edition of The Shine on Spotlight. The Shine on Spotlight. On today's episode, I shine a spotlight on a recent article from the New York Times by Christina Karen titled ADHD Constrained Relationships. Here's how couples cope. The article talks about how the symptoms of ADHD can push couples to their breaking point and the relationship between ADHD and relationships and marriages. This article is a must read. An important focus of the article is on education and finding ways to communicate and really learn about ADHD and the symptoms and the impact 
it may have on relationships, conflict, and marriages. Now, there's a quote from Melissa Orlov, a marriage consultant, that says if your partner is chronically distracted, that means they are also distracted from you. So how do you handle? How do you cope? What role does ADHD play in the relationship and also in parenting? And what are the steps to take? Now, look, while the article talks about the relationship between ADHD and marriages, I see medical diagnoses such as ADHD play out in the context of divorce for many of the same reasons and also for different ones that are often amplified because parents will live apart and physically separate and there's a conflict. But the takeaway, Dave, to me is find a way to cope, deal with these issues head on, whether in a relationship, during a marriage, or going through a divorce. We've all heard the phrase, I messed up because of my parents, whether as a joke or as a justification. Our guest today in the Shine Up podcast is Dr. Galit Atlas. Her new book, Emotional Inheritance, is a number one new release on Amazon and explores just how true that statement may be. Dr. Atlas is a psychoanalyst and therapist in New York City. She's the author of three books and numerous articles focusing on gender and sexuality lead. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Welcome to the Shine On Podcast. How are you? Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here, Evan. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. And Galit, I want to get into your book. And to start, you open your book, Emotional Inheritance, with an incredibly powerful line. You start the book by saying, every family carries some history of trauma. Every trauma is held within a family in a unique way and leaves its emotional mark on those who are yet to be born. Can you explain what emotional inheritance and legacy trauma is? Emotional inheritance is about emotions that are transmitted from one generation to another. When we talk about this, these kinds of emotions, we often talk about trauma or other unprocessed emotions, raw emotions that is passed down from one generation to the next. And interestingly, we think about, and as you will probably talk about, the book is talking not only about that our parents, right, impact our lives, but even our grandparents, right? So when we look at our parents and our grandparents and really the generations that came before us, what's the link, what's the relationship to our mental health? You know, it is a good question. Because the truth is that maybe the, the more traditional way and the more the therapists think is that where, whatever your mental health is, it's about your childhood, right? You know that link. And that's the traditional link. Everything that happened to you in your childhood, everything that was said to you in your childhood. But this framework is slightly different because what it means is that it's not only what was said or done to you, but it is about who your parents are and who your grandparents were. And so it, the transmission, if we talk about trauma, for example, if your parents experienced trauma in their lives, and I'm glad you started with that quote, because in fact, you know, when I, when I teach that, and I teach that framework for clinicians often, even clinicians start by saying, I didn't have family trauma. I don't have trauma in my family. And as we start talking, there is no family that didn't experience some kind of trauma. Small T trauma or big T trauma. And we can talk about the different traumas that we talk about in the book, including death, right? Illness. So those kind of painful experiences are passed down. What's interesting to me, and I think it's incredibly important and powerful what you said, because there may be people out there who you work with and clients of yours and patients and even clinicians, as you mentioned, who may think they don't have family trauma. And you Mm -hmm. speak about in the book about emotional inheritance as a collection of silenced experiences. So can can you elaborate on that? You know, the book is not talking only about traumas. When we talk about inheritance, there is a lot on secrets, 
in the book, right? A lot of things about family secrets, things. And when we talk about family secrets, again, it doesn't have to be, you know, illicit things. It could be even things, there are a whole se- there is a whole section on things that happen in the beginning of our lives or before we were born. For example, if we are what I call an unwelcome baby, accidental pregnancies, these things are often kept as secrets. Parents don't tell their children about that. And and the truth is, right, you also don't want them to tell necessarily to tell their, their child that this is a, you, know, you, you were not planned and we didn't want you, right? But somehow those things that are kept from us from before we were born, I talk a lot about loss that happened before we were born, loss of siblings or loss of family members or loss, right? And all of those things that are held as secrets between people. And when we look at those family secrets, and you mentioned the different chapters in your book, what's the advice for someone who doesn't know that those secrets exist, that can't work with a therapist, can't work with someone like yourself Mm -hmm. because they're not sure what they're actually working through at a very young age. And it may not be until several years down the road until their twenties and thirties, or there may be a defining moment when they're married or something may happen that sparks an interest. And then really the, the, the research and the searching begins. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. You're touching here. They're exactly the right thing because there is no search without wanting to search, right? And so in some ways, uh, this book is for people who want to search. And including the whole idea of emotional inheritance, you can't just decide, right? You can't just go and find something without wanting to find it. And the truth is that in the book, I talk about that a little bit too, that in fact, we usually don't want to know, right? So we have a whole sophisticated defense mechanism that helps us collude with the people in our lives and not knowing. And we keep, as I call it in the book, we keep secrets from ourselves as well. And and I explain the, the mechanism of how we don't want to feel pain. And often you will hear people say, well, why, why is that good for me? Why should I even know, right? So the first step of identifying emotional inheritance is wanting to know and learning what emotional inheritance is is and how it works in families. How hard is that for someone? I mean, it's easier to not know. It's easier Mm -hmm. not to ask the tough questions, to work with Mm -hmm. someone like yourself. It's easier not to do that soul searching and look at childhood, look at the generations, parents and grandparents. Why do people resist doing the searching Mm -hmm. that you're referring to? Because they're afraid of pain. I think we're all afraid of pain, right? We don't want to know something that we don't know what to do with. And why knowing, right? I grew up in a family where, you know, my parents really believed that knowing is a scary and unnecessary thing. And the more you know, the more, you know, like it's going to be, you know, I always think about it like uh, when when a parent warns their child that if they cross their eyes, it's going to be stuck. That was my mother. She was like, no, 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 no. Don't open that box. This is going to be so dangerous, right? And you can never take it back. And I think that is, right? The feeling is that what if I I can't unknow then, right? And I think that leads people to not want to search. And you mentioned the parent-child relationship, which was one of the most fascinating chapters in your book. And you found that although it's the child who may be in therapy, it's usually the parent who often needs Mm -hmm. the most help. Why is that? You know, I look at families as a system, as a system, right? So there is something about when a child comes to therapy, and I, in the beginning of my career as a therapist, which was almost 25 years ago, I started as a family therapy. I used to see children But before you see the child, you see the parent and you ask the parents questions, right? You ask them, for example, how did you decide to name your child, to give your child that name, right? I have a whole section in the book about names and how we name our children. And you find fascinating stories about the fantasy that that parents had about the child. What did they hope this child would be through the name, right? 
And so I started with that. And I think the family, the family system idea is that everybody is part of that system. And usually there is one child who is sent to therapy, which we call the identified patient. And that is the child that holds the system, the, the, the symptoms for the whole family. And that is usually what you find when you meet children. That's fascinating. You talk about, Galit, the paradox between parents and children. When you say that parents want to protect their children from carrying that mm-hmm. pain, and children also try to protect their parents from having to reveal and relive their trauma. Talk to us about that cycle And are there signs that children show when they carry this repressed trauma? You know, I think that usually that trauma comes up a little later in life. Children are very tuned into their parents. So as long as the children are, you know, the attachment bond is the most important bond for the child's survival. The child needs the parents in order to survive, right? So the child is tuned into the parent and adjust and adapt, right? So I think that what we see is that parents try to protect their kids from knowing. They don't tell them often, or they tell them too much, right? And and they're, they're, and I think we all struggle with that, right? And a lot of parents ask me, so what's the right thing to do? We want to protect our children, right? And I, usually my answer would be that it's our job to process our history and our parents, you know, and our, and our ancestors history, if we want to protect our children, that this is our, right, this is our job. Do you find that there's an age of a child when certain conversations, or whether it's a time in a child's life, and the relationship between the child and parent, where some of these conversations, some of these discussions about family history, Mm. family trauma, childhood, or easier to have than others? You know, I think children give us the clue when they're ready. I don't think there is one certain specific uh, age. I think that children ask, you know, and you would know some people ask me, how do these people know their parents' uh, secrets, for example? Because parents communicate with their children non-verbally, Explicitly, right? If you ask, if you in one of the chapters I talk about Noah, who believed that he had a twin brother who died, right? And he and his mother is like, oh, you're so crazy, and you're so, you know, you and your bizarre fantasies, and she, and she dismisses it. And then after she dies, we find out he finds out that he actually had a brother who died, before, not a twin brother, but a brother who died before he was born. So the question is really, so how did he know that? Is that like a miracle? You know, and I think the answer is related to your question is that parents communicate with their children. Uh, They communicate through their body language, right? And in that specific story, it's obvious that when the child came with this bizarre fantasy, the mother had a very strong reaction or didn't answer him. Or so when children ask us questions, if it's not a question that touches our own pain, it's not so loaded, right? And I think when we follow our children's inquiries, I would say, then we know, and also where they signal to us that it's enough for them, right? Children at some point says like, you know what, I'm done, I'm done. And they go, <laughs> or they, right? there is some, children communicate with us. Sure. I mean, us. children are incredibly perceptive and, and, and communicative. You're absolutely right. You're right. Absolutely they right. tell us what they want to know. And they also tell us when they don't want to know. Yep. Right? Yep. And Galita, I, I want to switch gears and I want to talk about affairs and infidelity, which is a topic mm-hmm. and, and chapter in your book. And in the book, you speak about a client that was engaging in extramarital affairs. And you discuss that sometimes affairs don't have anything to do with the relationship. I mean, I see as a matrimonial and divorce attorney, mm-hmm. clients come into my office, they talk about infidelity or affairs. But there's often underlying reasons and things that transpire in the relationship leading up to that. Can you speak about extramarital affairs and generally the underlying triggers and cause and what you see in your practice? 
Yeah, that's a good question. You know, uh, the issue of is a very complicated one. Of course, in many cases, it has something to do with the relationship, right? And but but sometimes, in a very surprising way, what it has to do with the relationship is sometimes about related to aggression and how in the relationship the people can have to, they become like the parent child dyad and they protect each other from aggression and they take care of each other and they're very tender with each other and there is no room for aggression and the and then the affair becomes like a way to do something wild outside of the relationship of course it always ha- damages the relationship always even if unconsciously originally it is in order to maintain you know the the harmony in the relationship affairs are often a result of power some power dynamic i'm, I'm sure this is something you see a lot people okay. have affair right as a way to balance power and uh, the the part the one the person that has an affair has a secret suddenly and they get more power you know so right. it's it's a way to manage power in a again a destructive way to manage power uh, what i talk about in this specific chapter is about the way affairs are related to to loss and uh, you know it is we know therapists and there is research on that that there are more affairs in times of mourning and loss and after a major loss and that is related to the the dialectic tension i would say between life and death and the loneliness that one feels when they lose someone close that sometimes a marriage by definition cannot fulfill right because it's an existential loneliness so it is not actually about the relationship it is about our own loneliness and how we try to keep ourselves alive and and alive and right how we try to to keep being invested in life and sexuality is op- is often a way to do that and Galit, you talk about infidelity and the relationship to loss loneliness and trauma mm-hmm. Looking at it in the context of a marriage, and again, you're right, Mm -hmm. I see it in terms of my clients, people that I work with, you know, people search for something, look for something, you're right, often it is to create that or fix or change the power Mm -hmm. dynamic in, in the relationship. How hard is it to come back from infidelity in a marriage, in a relationship, especially if it links back to loss and trauma? It is very, very hard, actually. I think the betrayal is something that is really, really hard to repair. And the work of reparation, it's not impossible, right? The work of reparation is a work of really, of empathy on both sides. Empathy from the person who, who cheated understanding how you how destructive it was and how painful and hurtful it is and on the other hand right the empathy of the the person who were betrayed was right and understanding if if we're talking about loss something about the emotional loneliness and longing that loss created and what the other that that it's not necessarily personal and when you see another person right as if it's not your husband and look at them and say wow that person was suffering and was trying and i think in the chapter i'm really um describing that the the struggle with staying alive with feeling better then you can forgive you can understand and then the the couple can actually repair and get to a better place but I think this is a really, really, really difficult thing to do. And what's the answer? What's the secret for a couple who is going through life's ups and and downs together, suffering loss, suffering trauma, parenting? There's so much that happens in our Mm -hmm. lives, parenting, in in, in a marriage. 
what is the advice? What's the recommendation for a couple to tackle this early in their relationship before it gets too far down the path where you see an affair happening, where you see people headed towards a divorce? What's the answer to dealing with this head on? You know, I think this is the hardest question because it is, first of all, it depends on on the couple, but I think the the main thing that holds couples together and helps them repair and helps them work through difficulties is emotional honesty, is emotional honesty and, and the ability and empathy, right? And, and think about it. When I say emotional honesty, I don't necessarily mean that you have to tell the other person everything. Because we have to remember that sometimes what we, so to speak, call the truth is used to attack another person, right? I mean, how many times you've seen somebody throwing in, the, in their spouse's face, I had an affair, right? I'm not, I just want to be honest. But it is a way to attack the other person and say, somebody else loved me more than you did. Actually, I'm lovable, right? And you didn't give me enough. And that, that is not, that's not what I mean when I say emotional honesty, right? It's, it's the combination of honesty and, and compassion. And I think it's, it's the communication. Like in that example right. you just gave, which I think is absolutely perfect and, and brilliant, it's about the communication and the way in which couples communicate or don't communicate and what they use or what person uses to attack or to get back at someone. And really the destructive way, as opposed to working on the relationship, the way in which the building blocks just fall apart, as opposed to working together to build the marriage up and to work on whatever they're experiencing, either individually or together as a couple. Right, exactly. And you see, there are two things that are, you know, um, that are important in what you were saying. One of them is power dynamic. Every couple has a power dynamic. And I think part of, you know, in couple therapy, people look at the power dynamic and how, how we manage that, right? How, for example, say attacking in a, in a, you know, in a passive aggressive way, sometimes it is a way to, to balance power. And then the emotional honesty is the ability to really sit with that and say, huh, maybe the power in this, the dynamic here is not balanced, or maybe one part feels that they don't have enough power and they need to do something to, right? And the other piece is, is related to what, what they call a sibling rivalry. I mean, I don't know if you're smiling, but I don't know if that is something that you are, you see in couples. I think couples become siblings, right? And they have rivalry. They have competition. They have who's more successful. Right? It's related to a couple. To and, power. and once they start down that path, it's very hard to sort of entangle yourself out of it. Say more, as, as we therapists like to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And Galit, I, I want to talk about you a bit. And in the book, you know, you, you mentioned a quote from one of your, you know, mentors who stated that research is me search. Mm-hmm. And when someone engages in psychological research, even if it's unbeknownst to them, it's a quest to understand and heal ourselves and the people who raised us. So let me ask you, what was the motivation for you? writing your book, Emotional Inheritance, what did you discover about yourself and what did you learn? This book was an emotional journey for me because it started as a very, very uh, personal book. And I wasn't sure at the beginning what my research was. I I wrote uh, a piece for the New York Times. uh, That's the Noah story in the book, the the Noah Mm -hmm. chapter. And, and people, I got a lot of emails and right, publishers were talking to me about, well, let's make this a book. And I was like, I don't know what I'm looking for. Because for me, there is no research without me search, right? Sure. Because it has to connect with what you are looking for. And so as I started writing, I wrote two more pieces that were published in the New York Times uh, before I actually started this book. So it was three altogether. All of them are chapters in the book now. Suddenly I looked at those pieces and I thought, huh, okay, I see what I'm doing here, right? It's in the, like, it's very similar to the process of psychoanalysis, right? When you talk <laughs> about something and then, sure. and then you analyze it in retrospect, right? Okay, <laughs> I understand what's happening here. And I started going back to my own family. I write about that a little bit in the book, right? About uh, the way I grew up, the, the traumas in my family that, 
my parents never wanted to share with us, but we knew. There is one chapter in my mother's. My mother's brother died. He drowned in the ocean when he was uh, 14 years old and she was 10. And I write about it in a chapter when I talk about a patient who comes in and tells me that she lost her brother. And in that moment, I sit with the patient and I, I really honestly didn't remember that that patient is actually my mother, my, right? And I remember myself thinking, wow, what a horrible thing to go through without putting it together. And I described a way in which I, I was able to break that dissociation, dissociation and help my patient and talk about, right, and how my own family trauma sits, how I sit with it when I'm with patients. I believe that's incredibly powerful. And you talk a lot about your upbringing and growing up in Israel and, and, and the family and, and, and experiences that you went through. Mm-hmm. As you look back and as you wrote the book, what did you learn about yourself, your family, experiences that perhaps you were aware of and how those impacted you and then the experiences that from an early age perhaps you were not aware of i think every chapter taught me something about myself and it is you know in the book i talk about the uh, the freudian idea of nachtraglichkeit that is german and uh, it means afterwardness and the idea is that we go back to experiences and reprocess them and reprocess them again and again and again. And Freud wrote it about sexual abuse and I write it in the chapter on sexual mm-hmm. abuse, but it's actually true for every experience. I'm thinking about even COVID now, right? How we're going to process it again and again, how many, how many generations are going to process it. And so when Freud wrote it about, about sexual abuse, he was talking about when a child is sexually abused, they don't experience it necessarily as sexual right? Uh, They don't experience the depth of what it means, I mean, when I say that. And then as they grow up in every developmental phase and every life event, they will go back to it and reprocess it, right? When they have sex for the first time, when they marry, when they have children, or if they don't have grandchildren, or if they get their child gets to the age when that happened to them. And there are many, many points in their lives where they will re- examine it. And for me, the book was a little bit like that. You know, mm-hmm. it was another step in my Nachtraglach guide. I wrote something and then I thought, oh my God. And I felt I experienced it differently and I thought about it differently. And then I recorded the audiobook. Tell and us you, about that. Yeah. That was unbelievable. <laughs> I was sitting there in the studio recording this audiobook, reading it, and I was sobbing. And I was like, oh, my God, this is really, really hard. Yeah. But take and, us into take us into that moment. You're recording the audio book. Mm-hmm. You're sobbing. Take us into that moment, what it was like for you in that moment, in the present, experiencing, I would imagine, all sorts of different emotions and different feelings. You know, is the the experiences, I didn't write this book with somebody in mind, right? And I never thought I'm going to, right? I wrote it from a very, very personal place and very private. And I mean, these days when people, I get unbelievable feedback from people and emails and, and people, I even, I get so many emails of people saying they changed their life. And I'm, I'm kind of still overwhelmed by that thinking, oh my God, you believe it. So taking it, Taking you back into the audiobook, sitting there in a dark room, you know, the, the, the studio is dark. It's me and this iPad, and I read it, and suddenly so many emotion comes up. And you could hear it, actually, in the audiobook. You hear, I mean, they stopped it many times, but <laughs> especially when I was, but you could hear it in my voice, and sometimes they didn't stop it. And you actually hear me. Uh, being very emotional about not only about my own experiences, by the way, also about my patients. I feel it. I, I feel like this, these stories and these people live inside me, you know, and I, and I feel what they felt. And I think that's one of the reasons among many reasons, the book really registers with so many people because you talk from a place of experiencing it and, and, and empathy and putting yourself in your client's 
positions and feelings and all the emotion that you talk about, the audio book and reading your book and processing that and, and, and your life growing up, it's so important because the book is relatable and it really impacts so many people. And Galit, what's the message for someone reading the book? What's the one takeaway that someone who picks up the book, the message that you would want someone to get? I think what I wanted is really for people to have an emotional experience that is to some degree, I mean, it's a little grandiose to say transformative because that was not my intention, but but I feel like an emotional experience that is a healing experience, right? Where you read something and you think about your life and you think, oh, actually, that makes me think about, and then you think about something in your life. And I think that is, for me, that would be the, the most, you know, the best compliment I can get. Elite, I want to ask you, as we finish up on the Shine On podcast, about marriage and then remarriage mm -hmm. and emotional inheritance and trauma. Carrying trauma from relationship to relationship, if mm -hmm. it's not addressed, if someone isn't opening up about it and working with someone like yourself, a therapist or a professional, how does that trauma carry over from relationship to relationship? And then what's the impact if it goes unexplored and the questions go unanswered? It's a good question because there is no doubt that everything from previous marriage is carried to the next relationships. And, and I think there is always a fantasy for, for everybody, even those who don't admit it, I think, that a new relationship <laughs> will them, right? It will be in a new relationship. Of course. And, going to heal me. And I think part of it is that people end up div being divorced, right? There is so much pain and, and they, they, you know, they leave marriages very, very, very wounded. And so the fantasy is not just uh, some kind of bizarre fantasy, right? It is a fantasy of healing and of being loved again and being, and through that, being able to love yourself, right? And I think that's, where we have to flip it a little bit and say, okay, like how do we work about on ourselves and not put all that pressure on the next person that will definitely disappoint us because that's what relationships are, right? There is always disappointment. And I mean, one of the, the so to speak, secrets of relationships is that is that rupture happens and the research shows that a good enough parent, which is also a good enough partner right sure. makes mistakes and is not tuned into their child 70 percent of the time 70 percent. it means only 30 wow. percent of the time we are tuned in uh, which is it's so it's also a relief for a lot of parents right <laughs> because <laughs> it's, it's true also, no it's a fascinating statistic it is it is really that's what the research uh, shows right it's edtronic uh, research and I think that what it, what that means really is that the main work in relationships is not to make sure we don't disappoint each other or there is no rapture, but the main work is in the repair, in the ability to get back together and to work things through. And that I think that answers some of your question right about how we turn, how we carry with us the trauma of the past or past relationships into new relationships. It does. I want to ask you because it, it brings something else to mind. How open should someone be with a new partner about their past, about the trauma? Obviously, there's a concern or, or a fear of sharing too much, opening up too much and scaring the new partner off, whether you're dating or in a new relationship after going through a divorce or not. I wouldn't suggest starting it, <laughs> starting it the first date was talking about Exa Exactly right. If right. anyone listening who's on what to say on, and share on the first date, absolutely don't get into all your traumatic experiences. But I think it's a concern for many people who, and I see clients of mine who are fearful of getting back out there and dating. They're, they're not, you know, it's a scary process. They might not have dated for 10, 15, 20, 30 mm -hmm. years. The landscape of how we date has changed with technology and meeting people in different ways. And there's always that question and concern on what's next for, for, for me, what's next, what's yeah. out there, and really how to go about finding love and really the search for love again. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, we're, we're joking about the, you don't have to burden a new relationship in the first or second, you know, in the first and second date with your trauma. But I do think that it's important to share your fears. But because mutual vulnerability is, is the foundation of intimacy, right? Saying that said, you know, there is something to say about processing your trauma. It's true in in every relationship, in your relationship with your children, when people ask how much to tell them or not to tell them. It's the same question, right? In new relationships, being open and being vulnerable is is very important. And it's again, it's the foundation of intimacy. And yet, you don't want to process your trauma through your partner. You don't want to use them, so to speak, in, or your children, right, in order to process your trauma. So there is something to say about processing your trauma and communicating it with your partner in, in an honest way. You are a renowned psychoanalyst, a therapist, an accomplished and best-selling author. We've talked about the experience for you researching your book. You talk about your experiences as a therapist. You talk about the audiobook experience. You have a number one best-selling book out there. I am sure, as you mentioned, your inbox is flooded with comments and feedback, mm-hmm. and you've heard all the accolades and praise for your book. As you look back now on that experience and hearing from people directly and what they have to say, you mentioned the word transformative or the impact or life-changing. When you hear people describe your book in that way, what does that mean to you? How does that impact you? and your book, and the research, and the work that you've done Mm -hmm. over these years? You know, the book has its own life now. I wrote it, but it has, it's out there in the world, and I hope that it will help a lot of people, and I try to differentiate, you know, I have, I have a small life with a family and a practice, and, and, and I like my small life, right? <laughs> and I feel like this, these big words of, you know, transformative and life-changing, it's amazing, right? To think that something you created is, have, have, right, is, so, is so important for people and they, they, you know, helps them so much. And yet I differentiate between what I created and who I am, right? I am that private small person that created something that put I put out there and and I'm still trying to process, you know, all the responses. I still I still answer everyone, <laughs> you know. And the people <laughs> around me kind of like laugh and you know, and they, my children make fun of me and they say, Yeah, you're so interested in people's life, which is really true. You know, when people <laughs> when people write to me, I'm like, oh my God, and that person had this and they had that and yeah, that's a credit to you and what makes the book so powerful and, and, and really register with so many people out there. Glee, your book, Emotional Inheritance, is a must read. The impact is tremendous. Thank you for coming on the Shine On podcast. Tell all the listeners where they could pick up a copy of the book. You mentioned your articles. How could everyone who's listening find out about your work, articles, and the book? I think it's easy. This You just Google either my name or emotional inheritance emotional inheritance is on uh, every bookstore i hope and uh, i hear that it's on the airport and <laughs> definitely on, <laughs> on amazon uh, as well and audiobook on a few places so it's it's out there and galit this was an absolute pleasure thank you for coming on the podcast thank you so much Evan. episode 34 in the books dr galit atlas she was absolutely brilliant terrific What a spot. What an interview with her. Producer Dave, thank you as always. My pleasure. Another great one in the books. Dave, we are on a roll. Thank you for everything. And thank you to all the listeners. You can listen to the podcast on all major podcast platforms and at Pod 617, the Boston Podcast Network with the best guy in the business. Producer Dave, follow, subscribe, and head over to shineondivorce.com. Follow me on social media for the latest content. I'm Evan Shine. And I'll talk to you again real soon.